On behalf of all Mormon Palestinian Democrats, I <laughs> welcome you all to UVU. I started my uh, college career here back in 1962, a year after high school, and uh, it was unaccredited. I couldn't transfer any of my credits anywhere, but I went up to BYU after one year and graduated from there. So I, I'm home here, and um, I'm delighted to be back on campus. I always enjoy coming back, not just to Utah, but to this campus. Um, I'm going to speak to you with a little bit of authority today. Um, about three years ago, my wife sent away um, and gave us all our DNA for Christmas. You scrape your inside of your cheek, you put it in a vial, and you send it away. And the results came back, and I found out I was an Arab. <laughs> it was so exciting. <laughs> you know, it's not like I went around telling everybody I was Swiss or Swedish, but it was nice to know. And then later I found out that 40% of Jews have the exact same DNA. And so I didn't know if I had their DNA or they had stolen mine. So um, I found out that I come from the Levant. When they say that the majority of the people with my DNA come from Syria, northern Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, the Palestine area, and bits of the rest of the other countries. And then they start sending you quarterly reports, you know, like if you ever have surgery, be sure to tell your doctor that 30% of people with your DNA have blood clotting problems or most of the people with your DNA have diabetes, which I do. And, uh, and it's really useful, but it doesn't tell you anything about making peace, you know, like you're a peacemaker or you're a hothead or something like that. One of the worries I always have about giving speeches like we're talking about this week is it reminds me of a story of a guy who, when he gets to heaven, St. Peter meets him at the gate and he says, usually within 10 days you're asked to give a speech, so be thinking about what you're going to talk about. He says, well, I have no question what I'm going to talk about. So I'm from Pennsylvania, and I was in the Johnstown flood, and it was really horrible, and I want to talk about that. He said, okay, but give it some thought, because you've got lots of experiences in your life, and there are lots of things you could say. And he sees him the next day, St. Peter asks him, have you given it more thought? And he says, oh, yeah, it's a Johnstown flood. I'm going to talk about that. And it goes on for days, and he keeps talking about the Johnstown flood. Finally, he says, why are you so stuck on me doing that or not doing it? What's the problem? You want me to change topics? He says, no. He says, it's just that Noah's going to be in the audience. <laughs> so I come to this speech, and here's Dan Peterson. Now, what can I say about Muhammad that Dan Peterson hadn't thought before me? And what can I say about Muhammad that I haven't read in his excellent chapter and if you really want to have fun, you get this book called The Rivers of Paradise. The Rivers of Paradise is um, it's called The Rivers of Paradise, Moses, Buddha, Confucius, Jesus, and Muhammad as religious founders. And it's an excellent book about religious founders, but the chapter on Muhammad is a new book. I guess this is it, isn't it, Dan? Is it Francis Blair? This is really some of the best writing you'll ever read about Islam and Muhammad. And this book is a fun book because it gives you a lot of comparatives with all these religious founders in there. And so I, I want to talk a little bit about what it means to be a Muslim in America and just give you a little background so that you can scope out where is this guy coming from. I have a, just a, a, a great streak of luck as a life. What's the chance of beating the odds of your dad leaving an oppressive empire that made his life miserable and my grandfather so determined to make sure that none of his grandchildren get stuck in the Ottoman Empire off in Jerusalem in the late 1800s? And so my grandfather took every grandson, a poor daughter's got the short end of the stick, every grandson from the age of 11, 12, 13, 14 on 
got stuck on a boat someplace in Jaffa, Jaffa, out of Palestine, and sent away. And just depending on where that boat was going that day is where most of my uncles ended up. My father and all of my uncles going back through from 1913, 14, 15 to the mid-1920s, they were put on boats. My dad ended up on a boat that took him to Liverpool, England, and then the day the boat that was headed for America, he got passage. I am so lucky it wasn't Somalia or <laughs> France or something. I don't know. Anyway, think, think of beating the odds, how you got where you got. If every one of you went back and took a chart and just spelled out how many forks in a road you've taken to get to where you are, we're all miracles, all of us. You're all lucky to be where you are, unless you're miserable right now. Um, I'm ecstatic. And the reason I'm ecstatic is you think of all the countries in the world you could be born and raised in, and you end up in the freest, biggest, richest country in the world, and you think of the alternative. I'd be dead if my dad had never left. Three of five kids for the last 50 years, 60, 70 years, die by the age of five in Palestine. And if you did live through it, you'd, you'd, you'd be tortured in an Israeli prison if you had an IQ because you wouldn't want to live under the oppression. Not the Israelis' fault, it's a matter of history. Beats the hell out of being a, a Holocaust victim, but being here beats the hell out of being anywhere else in the world. So I look back every day when I wake up and I just count my blessings. And I say to myself, you have already won the lottery. Just shut up and be satisfied. Quit your whining. And you know what capitalists do all day. Every day on your way to the bank, you whine. It's just, it's just something about how heavy the money is or whatever it is. So anyway, I'm a deliriously happy capitalist. Um, and I am part of the military industrial complex that President Eisenhower talked about, and he's right. It's, it's a dangerous group of people. Um, I want to talk about my background so that you get an idea of what it means to be raised a, a Muslim in Provo, Utah. My mom and dad made their pilgrimage from here to Mecca, from Provo to Mecca, and back to here again. My mom and dad taught us everything as though we were being raised in a village on the West Bank. I don't remember having sliced bread till I was 15, 16, 17 years old. It was pita bread. And do I like pita bread? That's all right, but not like Wonder Bread, sliced bread, that really white stuff, you know, <laughs> that's full of air. <laughs> and you grow up thinking that, and you go to school and you, you're sent packing a heavy Persian carpet for your kindergarten nap. Remember that? And it was really heavy and I didn't like it and I traded it for a terry cloth towel because it was so light compared to the Persian carpet. We ate like we were in a village in the West Bank. We lived like it. We were like every immigrant that comes to America. You live poor. We never starved. We had a farm. We worked really hard and didn't know the difference. Um, I remember Whenever I'd see an airplane fly over, I'd think, wow, someday, wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that be great to go to work with a necktie on, with an air conditioner going, because we were always out in the farm in the sun. Every day when my father prayed, he prayed to the east, and I always wanted to know what was on the other side of Squaw Peak. Just, <laughs> just out of curiosity. And in my five, six, seven-year-old mind, I used to just picture just hordes of millions of people praying right behind Squaw Peak, Cascade Mountain. And I was curious about it. My father taught us we had to take our lunch to school because we couldn't eat any product that had pork in it. So we carried our lunch to school. And it was usually pita bread with a hunk of chicken or something. And my mother was illiterate, but she taught us everything we needed to know. The British were the worst people that ever lived. <laughs> It's what Boyd Peterson, I was in the eighth grade before I realized that Churchill was not a war criminal, he was a statesman. <laughs> it, was, it was a revelation. Said, Dad, how come you guys never talk about Stalin and Hitler? It's always Roosevelt, Churchill, um, those were the two criminals. And then Truman came later because he gave Palestine away. 
And I finally learned by the 10th grade that no, not at all. And we never had any uh, anti-Semitism, anti-Jewish, nothing. I mean, my father would only let me shop at the Jewish merchants. And for those of you that have been here forever, do you remember Norm Nathan had a shop down on Center Street? The Jewish guy, that was the only person my dad would let me buy my clothes from. And Norm dressed me like a refugee. I'm telling you, he'd say, you're gonna grow. That's all right if the sleeves come out to the end of your, your hands. You're going to grow. So, so I want to I want to get imbue you with just some feel for what it's like to be a Muslim in Provo among Mormons, and and just so that you, you get the right feel here, my father before they dedicated the Provo Temple went through it. And he comes home, and he hands me these brochures, and he says, "These are sacred. Don't." Don't defile them. I said, well, these are brochures, Dad. They're just from the temple. He said, no, no. He says, this is from their sacred building, and this is about them. And he says, you treat this like their sacred text. It's sacred to them, so it's got to be sacred to you. These are just brochures about it. They hadn't dedicated the temple, but um, never a derogatory remark about Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, Mormon doctrine, nothing. Anyone who believed and had a book was to be respected. And when you talked about this, about the, the believers and some kind of a pluralistic notion about if it's good enough for them and it's sacred to them and they do good works, help them along the way. So that's the way we were raised about Mormonism in this town. My mother and my father being semi-literate, my father could read the Quran, my mother couldn't read or write at all. My father would memorize the Quran and recite it and try to get us to recite it. We were native speakers when we entered public schools. We didn't speak much English. And by the third or fourth grade, I was just beginning to know the difference when I was using Arabic versus English. And it took me years to discover that I was bilingual. And then by the time I studied it and looked back, the scholars say that you usually develop about a 50 to 75 percent lit literacy or ability in each language, up to about 15 to 18 and then you take off in one, and then you end up with about 135 to 45% of both vocabularies. So in terms of brain function and neuro uh, storage, you end up with metaphors in both languages, and so it can be helpful, which essentially makes us all late, very late bloomers, because you're sitting back and sorting and saying to yourself, does it mean this or that? And everything you learn is by metaphor. Does, is it like this metaphor or that metaphor? And it was a great experience to watch in retrospect, but it took me clear into my 40s to begin to sort out what happened from 5 to 15 and from 15 to 25. And learning was a really difficult process for me. And I can't tell you how many times I had these paradigm shifts where just a whole tsunami of thinking would hit you and you'd say, oh, that's abstracting. You know, when you're 18, 19, 20, oh, that's the kind of analysis they're talking about. And, and then as you develop your vocabulary, I found out that it was an English problem. I didn't quite understand the words. I didn't quite understand the grammar. And uh, so I was a real Arabic-speaking immigrant's child trying to fit into an American paradigm. And I luckily had a lot of help, a lot of mentors. Um, my father made it to Utah in a very strange way. When he got to New York, got off the ship, no one met him there, but he had to have been between 14, 15, 16, 17, right in there. We, we're not sure, because we don't have all the records. We have found his second trip when he went back to get my mom. He worked his way as a peddler like all the Arabs of the, the early 19th century. They would come and they couldn't, they were unskilled. They did, couldn't find jobs in factories and things like that. So they would get backpacks that were essentially wooden boxes with straps around their shoulders and take the railroad where it would take them. So he would leave New York, maybe go to Philadelphia. The next place would be Chicago, Omaha, Denver, Ogden. He gets to Ogden, runs out of material. You send a telegram back and you say, give me the following items for his backpack. And when he was here, World War I broke out. And so he joined to become an American citizen. Now, just 
to, to get this straight, the way I was raised was extremely patriotic. My father went off to the Army and had never experienced camaraderie like he experienced in the Army in World War I. And when he finished with the Army, he told me he never had better friends in his life than those guys who went through the heavy artillery, the gas in the trenches, the whole war experience. And he came back nearly totally deaf. And the American Legion brethren that he joined with would come and visit him all the time. And they would have annual meetings, and they would have regular. He never felt camaraderie like that in his life. And he felt so patriotic that he owed back. And every time I'd ask him, you know, you ought to have a will so we don't end up in probate and end up paying too many taxes. And he would just sneer at me and he'd say, oh, if everybody thought like that, America would be really great, wouldn't it? He'd point to a fire hydrant. He said, who do you think paid for that? It wasn't a tax dodger. I mean, the worst form of humanity to him was rich people who dodged their taxes like we do today. And he would say, who's going to build the schools? Who's going to answer the fire alarms? When you call the cops and nobody comes, what are you going to do about it? Who's going to keep people in jail? And he would take this whole litany. It's pretty brilliant analysis for a liberal Democrat who was a Republican. He was a Republican. <laughs> My father was a Republican. He loved Eisenhower because he was a soldier too. And if he could start a religion of just soldiers, he would have because you could trust your fellow soldiers. So when I became a Democrat growing up, he just was shocked. And he was shocked because you can't be a Democrat. Look, Truman gave away Palestine and Eisenhower kicked the Israelis out of the, out of the uh, Sinai Peninsula. Eisenhower's the hero and he's a Republican. Truman's the traitor. He gave Israel a country. But dad, the march of history, ta da 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 get out of here, he, and he would argue with me. Well, why did I become a Democrat? I think I did because I was raised a Muslim with a lot of doctrines that coincided with what I thought were good Mormon principles. Now, I remember the first time that I encountered missionaries. I went to Hugh Nibley and I said, I think I'm going to join the church. And he said, and I'd already had him for, we called it Book of Mormon for Heathens. That was <laughs> the class we took from him. He sat me down, and I can't remember the exact questions he asked me, but he said, you're not ready. You can't join the church. It was like I'd flunked the quiz. You know, it was more like an IQ test, I think I flunked. And he said, you come back and tell me after you've read this and this and this. And so I read it, and eventually I, I, I was baptized, and I... Uh, I've been through the numbers and been a bishop and a high councilman. I know how it works, and, and it was a very fascinating experience. I was also a mason for about a year and a half in the Provo Lodge, Story Lodge downtown, and it was a, a whirlwind of, of thinking what happened to me from being a Muslim and uh, a lot of the non-Mormons and anti-Mormons at the time were in the Masonic Lodge, and I was there for a little bit. but. Um, Becoming a Mormon was a, a different experience for me because there was so much structure and a real hierarchy. And in Islam, there is no address for Islam. There is no Vatican. There isn't, uh, I mean, the other day I want to know more structure about the latest doctrine. So I go online. I mean, there's no place to look for if you want to talk to a Muslim for a th with authority. If you go to your local imam, you go to your local mosque, you meet your local Muslims, but there is no international. There's a kind of an international, what is it, the, um, the League of Islamic States? Is that what it's called? And what else? What's the best center of Islam? A phone number or an address? There isn't one, is there? The, what, yeah, the Muslim World League. Is that the one in Saudi Arabia? Yeah. And then there's the Sheikh Al -Az Azhar in Egypt, but there are also other sheikhs and ayatollahs around. There is no address. On, in the Mormon case, you go online, you hit the wrong button, and the missionaries will be there in about 20 minutes. <laughs> so it's completely different. I mean, it's not even, not even possible to compare. Well, my dad ends up in Utah, comes back a disabled veteran. They give him a homestead in price, and he tries to farm it, and he can't. 
So he moves to the nearest city where there are other Arabs. And I was going through doing family history a couple of years ago here in, at the courthouse. And I found dozens of Arab families on property in Utah, and they, in southern southern part here in Provo, Utah County. And they traded land back and forth, constantly buying and selling land to each other because they were coming and going. And my dad ended up buying land from other Arabs who were here before him by about 10 or 15 years. So we weren't the first, but we were the, one, the only ones to stay. And I think we were the only Muslim family in Utah, but there were other Arab families, but they were Christian from Lebanon, primarily. And they were like family to us because we all spoke the same dialect of Arabic. Ours was more like West Virginia Arabic. It was really, really rustic. I mean, when I went back and started talking to my relatives, they just said, you know, nobody's talked like that since Grandma died. <laughs> and my Arabic today is still, it's, it's, you know, it's like I'm from Roosevelt or someplace, you know, or Vernal maybe. All right, Hebrew. Uh, it, it really is West Virginia Arabic. And I went and got it, I did the master's work at the University of Utah. And, Going through that, my Arabic was so rustic that it was, I should have been an anthropology. Um, my dad went home and married my mom and said, I'll be back for you as soon as I build the house and plant the orchard. And that was around 1920, 21, 22. He married her, they started a family, she had one child, and then he left and he went back for her 10 years later. While he was gone, the baby passed away, and he brought her back, and she tells me the story. When she was alive, we would always ask questions about what was it like. She said, we, we would do things in groups there, like caravans. If we were going to come out west, we'd find out who was going to the next big city. You want to read a really great story by Louis L'Amour called The uh, Walking Drum. Nobody would go out on their own. They'd always get in caravans. Well, my mom tells me about the story of they got in a Model A Ford probably around 1930, 31. It took them a month and a half to get from New York to Utah and that they would just go from city to city in groups of three or four cars to help each other out. She gets to Provo, Utah. Dad had a house built for her. He had a orchard planted and he plants her down in his house. She didn't speak a word of English. She didn't even have a wardrobe to function. One of my uncles told me the day your mother left the village was the first time I ever saw an Arab woman in a dress. My dad had arranged to go to Yaffa, the big city, buy a dress for my mom so she wouldn't have to come in her thub, her, her uh, peasant lady dress. There was my mother, didn't even, she had never cooked on a stove and um, the neighbors that came to her rescue were all Mormons. The Relief Society presidents would come in and say, here's how to do this, here's how to do that. She wanted to make bread, but she had to do it on a, in a big taboon, they call it, a big man-made oven outside where you'd stoke it up. And, you know, when you go to the pizza place today, it was like that, except different. Um, so he plops her down and... She has 10 kids, two die, eight of us survive. And if there's an attribute that comes out of it all is we were raised in some really, what you'd call fairly strange ways. Um, I never, I, I, I'll never forget, uh, I got a job working for Taylor Brothers when it was an old department store downtown. Sterling Taylor was one of the last owners and he would tell me stories about being at war with my father. So they'd be out there in the, on the Western Front, and it was someplace in France, and he says at night when Dad had to do his prayers, he'd take his prayer rug out, and the heavy artillery would be blasting away, and you'd see his shadow and watch him as the explosion of the guns went out. You'd look at Ned be Moses Cater out on his prayer rug doing his prayers. He says he never missed. He never missed in the war. So when we were here and we're going through everyday life, we'd be out on the farm, father would pray. I'd be on our way to market. There's a fruit market in downtown Salt Lake City and we'd get up at three in the morning. My dad kept me out of school till September, end of September every year till I was in the 10th or 11th grade. 
because I was the natural farmer with him. I was kind of the partner. And we would always stop at Murray Park all the way up the highway, which is only Highway 89 at the time, and he would go off to Murray Park and pray. And I would wait in the truck for him, and then he would go on the rest of the trip. I'm going to advance ahead a little bit. I didn't think very much of it until one day at the age of 18, we're on our way to New York, and I'll tell this, finish this story a little later. He, he was taking us home, didn't tell us he bought one-way tickets to take us home to marry our cousins. But we were going through Pennsylvania, and we'd stopped at a Howard Johnson, and he said, it's time for me to pray. And you're 18, you know, all you care about is how you look in the clothes you're wearing. Yeah, the last thing in the world you want to know is, or want people to know is that you're associated with these people called mom and dad. And he goes around the back of the Howard Johnson where there's grass, puts his prayer rate down, and he starts to pray. And everybody in the restaurant stops. Says, look at this guy. Look at this guy. Everybody's looking out the back. And my brother and I and two sisters are slinking down in the chair thinking, oh, please. And it was, as I look back now, I couldn't be more proud. There was my father, an adherent, never, never missed a prayer. And there he was out in back of a, Pennsylvania Howard Johnson sang his prayer and then he would come back and he would eat and he'd say um, it may make you ashamed but it makes me more disciplined and it's good for you to do what you don't always want to do where it's not comfortable and he was great about teaching us things indirectly and it took us years to appreciate our dad and of course now we revere him we can't find enough pictures of him you can't tell enough stories about him but I think that's probably an attribute we all share. And what was it about him? He was a Muslim's Muslim. He was not a fundamentalist. He, wasn't, he, was, a, he was a traditional Muslim, and a traditional Muslim in the sense that he, we, he adhered all, to all the dietary rules. Our house was always uh, halal dietary-wise. Um, treat people well all the time. You don't need a lawyer for every agreement. Just a handshake will do. And, and this honorability of integrity, this idea of trust, was just everything to him. Well, he wasn't any different than our neighbors. All of our Mormon neighbors were the same. The old guys, just the same. People saw me downtown, they knew who I was, and they'd stop, make sure that I was being good. Give me a ride home. Muslim or Mormon, it didn't matter. You had to know that Eventually, you had the family name, and my dad, when we left the house, you know, you're taking the family name with you. Don't do anything that would shame us. So, you grow up a Muslim among the Mormons, and you realize, well, we drank tea and we drank coffee at home. And most of my Mo Mormon friends thought that that, uh, that was pretty bad, and we thought they were funny. No, no umbrage taken. We didn't care. I mean, what, what, what would they know about what was bad about it? tea or coffee. And I, we started to see the little things that, you know, I can't drink coffee. Well, you just hold it with your hand. No, no, I can't drink it because of doctrine. And I, it took me years to realize that I couldn't tell the difference between Mormon doctrines, coffee and tea, and eating between meals. I thought eating between meals was a sin in Mormonism because these Mormon kids' parents would not let them eat between meals. And, and there was one other thing that I tied to it, I mean, and that was Fast Sunday. My mother fed every kid in the neighborhood on Fast Sunday. <laughs> and I thought they liked us, and that's why they were coming over. <laughs> And you know what my mother would say? Isn't that amazing how that one day a month, how cruel Mormon mothers are to their kids. <laughs> so you can tell the, the level of sophisticated understanding we had of our neighborhood. Let me tell you what uh, my father would typically do at the end of every day during harvest. We'd get down to the railroad tracks with our load of cherries, pears, apples, and ship them. And at the end of the truck load, he would always throw on boxes of cherries or apples or whatever it was. And he'd say, now this one goes to the police station. 
This one goes to the fire station. And you take this one out to the state mental hospital out on Springville Road, and then you take the load down to the railroad and weigh it. And it would always be sometimes as much as a third to a quarter of your load would be donated. And he'd say, you have to do that. You've got you to gotta share with the community. My dad didn't know the difference between this Mormon community he belonged to and the Muslim community that eventually, when we went back to uh, our home village. He, the sense of community, the ummah, if you didn't do your part, you didn't belong. And every chance he got. And then it got to the point where, I don't know, Pax, if he ever dropped stuff off at your place, but he made us take it to the lawyers and the doctors and the judges. And, you know, the judges, of course, were worried about conflict of interest and taking a <laughs> bushel of apples. My dad was never in trouble, so I don't think it ever occurred to him. But he was always having to give. And it didn't occur to him that he had a responsibility to the community. He just knew that, he, that it was just part of life. That a rational person wouldn't do it. So I grew up in a household where we were constantly reminded about our responsibility to our community. And uh, because dad was a veteran, he expected all of us to serve. And we were children, he would make us practice saluting so that when we grew up, we'd already know how to salute when we went to the army. Well, when we grew up, it was the heat of the Vietnam War, and a lot of us didn't want to go. And I'll never forget January 25th, 1967, is my wedding day, and I got my draft notice on my wedding day. And my dad was weeping for joy that Uncle Sam thought enough of Moses Cater's son to take him. <laughs> And I was weeping for an entirely different reason. <laughs> and it was, a, it was a great experience to watch my dad when we would come home on leave the first time in uniform. It was the happiest day of his life to see his son in uniform. So all six of us had to serve. We didn't have to serve, but we did serve. I've got one brother that just left the Utah National Guard after 26 years. But dad was pleased to have us serve. And of all the duties that I got when I went during the Vietnam War, I didn't go to Vietnam, I was lucky. For those that went uh, and didn't come back, I had a whole, there were a thousand of us from Utah in one group that went, and nearly all but 10 of us went. I ended up in Germany and took my wife with me. And it, it was a, you know, it was just another lucky break that I had. And, uh, Dad was always, he would ask me all kinds of questions about what it was like and didn't you feel great about serving with all these guys and isn't it great that you could serve your community? And, and he said in the Arab world where he grew up, going off to war was the worst thing that could happen to you because you usually didn't come back. Your family had to buy your rifle and they had to send you money to buy your ammunition and your uniform. It was a form of family tax for all the kids. That's why my grandfather sent them all away. What time do we want to start our conversation? Uh, questions? The session ends at 11.15. So all right, I'm going to stop about 10 too, so we can have some time for questions if, with the, us, the rest of the panel. Let me tell you what I'd like you to think about. And Dan, I'm going to use the quote in the foreword of your book, Three Rivers by Hans Kohn. This is what we should be thinking about, and I want to read you something before I do. Here's the headline. Thirteen dead as Christians and Muslims fight in Egypt. This is a not too lengthy a story to read. I want you to hear it. Clashes between Muslims and Christians in Egypt left 13 dead and 140 wounded deepening a sense of chaos as the police and ruling military struggled to maintain order barely a month after a popular uprising ousted the, uh, the dictator. A sign of how much security has broken down, the pitched battles, the deadliest in years, went on for nearly four hours. Tuesday night, as both sides fought with guns, knives, and clubs, Army troops fired in the air to disperse the crowds to no avail. The new cabinet sought to reassure Egyptians on the Wednesday night, ordering police to immediately take back the streets. 
the spasm of violence offered a glimpse of what has gone wrong in a one-time police state that now finds itself with less than half of its security forces and, ha and its military on duty. The fighting began when a Muslim mob attacked thousands of Christians protesting the burning last week of a church in a village south of Cairo. The Muslims torched the church amid escalating tensions over a love affair between a Muslim woman and a Christian man. The relationship set off a violent feud between the couple's families. The, women's, the woman's father and cousin of the man were killed. At one point in the battles, Christian protesters blocked a vital highway, burning tires and pelting passing cars with rocks. Security officials said seven Christians and six Muslims were killed. The wounded were 72 Muslims and 68 Christians. Among the officials who spoke on condition of anonymity, anonymity because they were not authorized or didn't have the courage to speak up. Troops later arrested 20 people. Even before the uprising and the toppling of the Mubarak uh, dictatorship, tensions had been growing between Muslims and Christians. The Coptic Christians minority t makes up 10% of Egypt's 80 million people and complains of widespread discrimination that they say relegates them to second-class citizenship. That's in today's Daily Herald and today's New York Times. Now think about that for a minute. Here we are in the 21st century. It's 2011 and Christians and Muslims with meat axes are going at each other. What's that? thousand, two thousand year old story. It doesn't end. And if you get to a certain part of the community, Bahrain, Sunni Shiites fighting each other. You get off into Iraq, Sunnis and Shiites fighting against each other. And you just finished a lovely overview of history of the sophisticated hatred that goes on. I want to cut short a lot of this discussion and just read to you probably the the best message that we could get from this history that tells us what we ought to be doing about it, what we ought to be thinking. This is Hans Kung in the forward to the book, The Three Rivers of Paradise. In the forward of the book, he says, to be sure we live in a world, and this is in July of 2000, to be sure we live in a world and a time in which peace is threatened in many countries by every possible kind of religious fundamentalism, whether Christian, Muslim, Jewish, Buddhist, or Hindu. Such fundamentalism is often less rooted in religion than in social misery, in reaction to Western secularization, and in the need for a basic orientation of life. My response to this challenge is this, and this is the punchline, there will be no peace between the religions without a dialogue between the religions. There will be no peace between the religions without a dialogue between the religions. Peace is a central feature in the system of most religions. Their first task in our age should be to make peace with one another. By every means, including those now offered by the media in cases like the former Yugoslavia, the religious must give priority to implementing those measures that create trust and then he gives us specific lists of what we ought to be doing. And let's not kid ourselves. We don't need to go out and try to find the non-believers and tell them that they need to believe. We need to be working internally on that religious level before we get to telling others what to do. Number one issue is clear up misunderstandings. Clearing up misunderstandings between religions. Number two, healing traumatic memories. I have a Jewish friend who told me that they can't drive Mercedes in his family because they were made by Germans. That there's a good reason. I mean, if I were Jewish, I probably wouldn't either. But then he went further and he said, do you remember the book Henry Ford wrote, The International Jew, an anti-Semitic screed? We can't drive Fords either. And I got to thinking, based on who you are, do you have a list of things you can't do? I mean, can 
When you get to Illinois, do you all buy a jar of peanut butter and a loaf of bread so you don't have to stop at any restaurants and spend money? Uh, you boycott Illinois because of what Governor Ford did to the early saints? Or Missouri? How many of you boycott somebody because your parents or grandparents did? A little silly, maybe? All right. Neither do I. Third issue. The second one was healing traumatic memories. The third one, dissolving hostile stereotypes. The fourth, coming to terms with conflict caused by guilt in societies and individuals. Breaking down hatreds and destructiveness. Second to the last, reflecting on what is held in common, which is what we're doing today. Offering positive models. This conference is in perfect harmony with what we ought to be doing. And we ought to be doing more of it. And I don't know at what level you do it or what city you do it in, but I can just tell you, clearing up misunderstandings just can't happen fast enough. I'm going to uh, a conference here next month where we've got Jews and Palestinians to sit down and simulate a, a negotiations. But they've done it a little differently in this simulation. I, they've got the biographies written of all the people who have negotiated. They've got all the issues all laid out. And we take roles in this simulation. And I'm, I'm an Israeli in it. And the Israelis are Palestinians in the, in the simulation. And we have to do a pretty decent job and stand our ground. And we have to make it realistic and intellectually do it with integrity. Well, I've done this before. I've been part of the Middle East um, negotiations project at Harvard for a couple of years where they've got four Israelis and four Palestinians and then other. And the other observe us. And they put us in a big room with mirrors and have students who don't have a vested interest in the ar uh, arguments watch us. And as the Israelis sit down on one side, and this is, we started 20 years ago, the Palestinians, we start talking and we start saying, I'm just curious, <laughs> why are you guys such, and there are a number of pejorative words you can use for that, and you try to soften it by saying, and they say, well, we're, we're, we're not, you don't understand the Holocaust. Well, all right. Anyway, I found a way to talk with people who are on the opposite side there are only a few groups that you don't have sympathy for, you know, I, in, in the world you can't deal with. I, you know, vicious anti-Semites, you really can't bring them to, uh, to any kind of a natural conversation because they, they don't have the intellectual wherewithal to understand where you want to go, and so you can't deal with them. But every time I talk with a Jewish person, if you'll start the conversation with something to do with the Holocaust and who did you lose, you make a lot more headway than who do you think you are, smarty pants, you know, or something like that where you insult them. And I can just tell you there are a lot of ways to break things down. Now, there are a couple of things that as a Democrat, I want you, uh, you folks to help me understand. Why is the church 82% Republican? How can you be Christian and be a Republican? <laughs> now, <laughs> now, for those of you that are Republican, how do we start a conversation like that? <laughs> and for those of you that are Democrat and clap, you're in trouble. <laughs> so you learn, how do you dismantle? You know, it's like you come home after work and you're tired and your wife says, told you to take out the garbage, and the first thing you say is, oh, yeah? Well, you can't go anywhere with conversations like that. And so you learn when you're talking with Jewish people or with radical Muslim who really want to think that violence is a good political tool, you have to stop and say, how do you communicate? How do you talk through it? And it's not an easy one. So I just, I just want to leave you with that five, and I've got a ton of other stuff, but I'm not going to give it all to you except... I did want to know how you Mormons come across, we Mormons come across on the internet. And I found this really interesting piece in the Priesthood and Auxiliary Leaders Guide. And it starts with, become defenders of the faith. 
And that's music to my ears as a Muslim. Become a defender of the faith. And it talks about the fourfold mission of the church. Become a defender of the faith. You have an obligation to become a defender of the faith. Go on a mission, missionary work. Redeem the dead, temple work. Um, assist the poor is the new one. That's a fourth one that we hadn't seen before. And the last one is um, what, it's missionary work, redeem the dead, perfect the saints. In Islam, there are two struggles that we go through. They call it the little jihad and the big jihad. Struggle is jihad, or you can translate it in a pejorative of holy war. The little jihad is to perfect the Muslim, do the right thing, work and struggle and resist your carnal instincts and bridle your passions. You know that language. Try not to do bad things. Pay your dues to society. In Islam, it's the ummah, U-M-M-A, the ummah. We owe the ummah something. In, in, in America, it's you know, patriotism requires sacrifice. Perfect, perfect your soul in Islam. And the second one is defend the faith. Just the same exact language is on the priesthood guide on the internet. Defend the faith. When there's a Muslim in peril anywhere in the world, do what you can to help them. Uh, the Israelis are occupying the West Bank. Well, let's wipe Israel off the map. That's one extreme. That's not going to happen. And a good Muslim would say, let's go make peace among them. And a flood hits a community someplace, and you stakes get together, and they take go to Haiti and they, ha they help Mormons and non-Mormons. But you have this sense of community. I cannot begin to tell you the millions of dollars that the Mormon church has poured into Gaza for Muslims and Palestinians in help, educational and health kits. They don't advertise it. They don't talk about it. We're not supposed to brag about it. But they're constantly giving wherever it has to go. The stories of Katrina, the stories of Haiti. And so, as we go through this comparison, just go online and look in the Frontline series and look under the beliefs and daily lives of Muslims. You're going to find a lot of things that are similar, but there's going to be more that you have that's different about you than similar. But what you're going to find out is, do you want to talk? Do you want to reach across? Or do you want to sit back and say, I don't think I want to talk to a Republican today. I don't think Democrats belong in this church. I don't think Muslims are tame enough to actually be treated as people of the book. And I can think of a million reasons not to talk to everybody in the world. But I can tell you, the business of having churches active in our democratic lives as heavily as churches are acting in our country today is not healthy. There is too much religion in public life in America. Not too little, too much. And with that package comes narrow minds who make enemies of other churches. I have a Baptist minister that lives three doors up on our lane. He hates Mormons. He's a second generation Baptist minister. And the language he uses on Mormons is worse than anti-Semitism. I can't get to him. I can't even begin to get to him. And I haven't broke it to him that I was a Muslim once. He can't get past Mormons. <laughs> now, how do you reach that guy? You don't. You just do a good deed for him. Maybe three, maybe 20, maybe 100, and maybe you'll turn his heart. Maybe I won't. So you just try to be nice. All I can tell you is there is too much religion in the public square today. Too much bigotry, too much intolerance, and too much just absolutely hypocritical behavior. If there were true religion, whether it was Muslims, Mormons, Catholics, anyone else, living what their real intention of their religion was, you think there'd be any war today? You think there'd be any burnings of Christian mo uh, churches and Muslim mosques. We need to temper our society on what role religion needs to play in our lives and in our communities. But when you get legislators who are legislating their religious agenda, 
in the legislatures. And all you have to do is look at the difference between what the church influenced your legislature in Utah to do and what the Mormon legislators in Arizona did and continue to do. You are worlds apart within your own church. And there's a lot to learn about that. We have a lot to do to tame ourselves. And so the first struggle is that little jihad in each one of us, Mormon or Muslim. Perfect the saints. Little jihad, it's the same concept. And I think we ought to work very hard about working internally before we go out to the world to teach them how to be nice. Thank you very much for inviting me. To First of all, Omar Cater, I want to thank you for coming uh, to UVU to speak. Um, I, th I think some of the things that you've said have been really insightful and helpful for us. Um, given your background and some of the things that you mentioned, I wanted to ask you a question uh, specifically about the West Bank where, as you know, Christian and Muslim Palestinians are working together to end the occupation. Before uh, I came in here, um, uh, to listen to you, I was participating in a press briefing where two Palestinians who are currently in Ramallah and one Palestinian female in Gaza were talking about um, protests that they are now organizing, similar to the models that we've seen in Tunisia and Egypt. And they mentioned that they're using some of the same manuals that um, those protesters use in those countries. There's hundreds of uh, youth groups that are working together in, uh, in, in this struggle. I wanted to ask you, um, given the nature of the occupation and your background, do you think that, this, that these, this is the model and these are the methods that can be used, or is it something else? Well, the something else has not worked, and they've been practicing it for 60 years. But um, I'm convinced that if they stay on the nonviolent approach, you'll end up with more Israelis joining them than other Arabs. Um, the, the Israelis have a very mature peace movement. And the Palestinians, when they started suicide bombings, destroyed and discredited the whole Israeli peace movement. Just essentially made it impossible for any Israeli to reach across. Once those suicide bombings started killing civilians, it was the end of Palestinians in terms of negotiations. That there's a fellow by the name of Gene Sharp, and he's in his 80s, and he wrote these books that everybody's using out in Egypt and Tunisia. You can download his 173 suggestions on how to peacefully do it. I just recently bought most of his books, and they're just everyday things. But I have had an Israeli tell me that the Israeli intelligence and military fears a nonviolent movement more than they do terrorists, because a nonviolent movement could be legitimate to other Israelis. So whenever they've been able to pick up movements that are budding, starting, I have a close friend, Mubarak Awad, 20 years ago, who started a Gandhi, Martin Luther King style, and they deported him very quickly. And they disbanded that because they know how effective it would be. I think it would be pretty difficult for an Israeli government to beat up a nonviolent movement because there are enough Israelis that would join them. I don't worry about the whole Israeli society. I only worry about their extreme right that gets elected, that our Congress backs, that Orrin Hatch has attached himself to in this country, typically, not just by himself. He's on the, he's on the wrong side of war. Hi. This is Shirley Paxman, one of my Youngest best friends. And I'm going to tell you a story about the Cater family. Uh, my father uh, had the responsibility of doing all the legal work to bring the Cater family to uh, the United States and to Utah. So we've been friends for a very long time. Uh, I have to tell you, one morning, we were, I come from a family of nine girls and no brothers, but uh, my family was very active Mormons. And every Sunday morning, 
we'd get up and get dressed in our Sunday clothes and go to church. Well, this one Sunday, we were all dressed up in our Sunday clothes, and my father came in and said, take off your Sunday clothes and put on your work clothes, because most cater strawberry patch, he's going to lose it if it isn't picked today. And we've got to go out and pick the strawberries. So we all put on our work clothes, and we went out to the cater farm, and we spent the morning picking uh, Moses' strawberry patch and saving the entire crop so he could sell it. So uh, I've told this story to uh, Omar once before. But um, it, we, we loved the Cater family. We would often open our front door and find incredible gifts of food and things that Moses raised on his farm, fruit, all fall, we'd get wonderful baskets of fruit. So I just wanted you to know that, that this is a remarkable family, and uh, I treasure the friendship of the Cater family. Thank Thanks. you. You know, um, Judge Paxman and Shirley, in our family, we often refer to these people who had the Semitic warmth. They have the Semitic gene. There was, you never worried when your dad went to the Paxmans because they understood his baggy pants and his funny hat and he was deaf and he talked really loud. We were supposed to talk loud to him, to him not to us, but that's the way it worked with dad, wasn't it? He talked loud. Anyway, thanks. Yes, sir? Okay. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I, I think I represent a small minority in this group. I come from the non-religious atheist sect among us. Um, I would like to say thank you so much for what you've said. And I appreciate the, the comments of how we need to separate religion from our politics. I'm not, sorry, I'm nervous talking. Well, um, deep breath and relax. You're among I know. friends. Here we go. <laughs> I'd like to say we, there's so much good in religion, all religion. And we need to come together on grounds. And where do we start that? Do we start that with the leaders of each religious organization? Do we start that within like s individual groups am in the, among the religions? How do we get that religion out of politics? How do we get that agenda just separated from our politics so we can actually come together as a collective community within the politic arena, political re are we, are arena? Well, one of the things that, um, and, and you shouldn't be hesitant about telling us that you come from a non-religious, as soon as you use the word atheist, it's like swearing in some communities. But let me just tell you, if you take the traditions that you have to follow, yours are more rigorous than, than other people because you've got to take all the ethicists from Socrates on. Just taking, I mean, are you familiar with uh, Rawls? If you take what Rawls describes as the, the good life, and you take just the ethics of saying, what is, what is the least you can give society? And you take that, the veil, Rawls says, just suppose you don't know where you're going to live. You're in the, you're in the life before you come down. For you Mormons, it's in the preexistence. For the Muslims, just imagine you're not born yet. You're behind the veil and you say, out there, there is a world. There are the slums of Mumbai. There's Las Vegas. There's the golden city on the hill called Salt Lake City, which is the perfect place where everybody's born with straight teeth and no orthodontists anywhere. Um, there's just all kinds of places you're going to be born. And you don't know where and you don't know what you're going to be, whether you're going to be six foot seven and be an NBA player, a football player, you're going to be healthy, not handicapped. What's the ideal for you to have? And he says, well, I want everything to be available to everybody in terms of positions. I want the ability to go to school and get rich. I want the maximum benefits that everybody else has and a bunch of other, what else have I missed? What else has he said? Well, just, yeah, just the, the good life. The good life. The perfect life. 
Yeah, I don't want to be born into a society where I have to be upper class and I can't go to school unless I'm, uh, you know, one of Madoff's kids or something. Um, and he, he draws that. And now that's about as secular as you can get, isn't it? Sure. So, now when you take that, you have more strictures in your non-religious philosophy than most of these people. And so if, aim high. What year are you in school? Aim really high. And you can do it in your community. You can do it internationally. You can become a blogger. There are a million ways to do it, but aim high because you're far more efficacious than you think. You'll influence people. This sharp guy who wrote these manuals, he didn't think it was ever going to come to anything, and he brought three governments down practically from Boston. And he's 82 years old, and he didn't think anything of it. Don't underestimate your power. And don't be shy about being an atheist, because eventually, how old are you now, 23, 24? 27. 27, all right. By the time you're 50, you'll probably make about four revolutions. So give yourself a chance to be a believer, a non-believer, a believer, a non-believer, a heretic, a skeptic. You're going to change. If you're a really bright guy, you're going to make a lot of changes in your life. Give yourself a chance. Grow with it. But aim high, because you might. You just might change things in a big way. And uh, don't be afraid. Just be fearless. You know what really made these revolutions happen? I've been taking all the texts that I can get from Libya, Egypt, and uh, Tunisia. And in every case, the difference ma made was I was watching television. And when I saw the troops attacking the citizens, I knew I needed to be there, and I said to myself, I don't care if I die. I have to be there to help them. And it was fearlessness. When you become fearless, you become your most dangerous. I don't mean dangerous in terms of harming people. That's when you'll do anything. And in every case, whether it was Tunisia or otherwise, when that guy, the fruit vendor in Tunisia, had that woman cop come up to him and try to take his fruit cart away from him, which was his sole means of making a living. He had a college degree and he was peddling fruit. And he went, she went to him to inspect and said, you're out of inspection, confiscated his cart. He went downtown and said, I want my cart back. And they laughed at him and threw him out. So he went to the governor's office and they threw him out and frustrated, he went home changed his clothes, got himself a gallon of gas, and burned himself to death. That's just beyond for him. And when the crowd found out about that, they went nuts. June 6th of last year, a bunch of kids were sitting in an internet cafe in Cairo, and they watched the police come in and grab a kid, take him outside, and beat him to death in front of everybody. This guy happened to be a Google rep, and he said, I couldn't stand it any longer. Any society that could sit back and watch injustice doesn't deserve to govern. And so he started to pull together his internet crowd. And they planned from June 6th to January 25th when they struck, and they overthrew the government. And what was it over? It was killing that Saeed guy in Cairo. And the family stuck with it. Fearlessness is probably the most powerful weapon we could all employ. Don't be afraid about your beliefs. You're going to change eventually. Just watch out, because you might become a Republican. <laughs> Anyone else? I just, I just want to thank all of you for coming, and, and I appreciate it, Brian, and the work that you and your colleagues are doing on things like this in Provo, Utah, of all places, nothing, nowhere is too far to be studying serious topics. Anyway, thank you again.